uh, to our colloquium on the anti-epidemic measures on the outskirts of hubs of monarchy. Uh, the guest lecturers today will be Dr. Zabina Jesner from the University in Graz and Dr. Kristina Pugizevic from the Catholic University of Croatia. Uh, I am Ivana Horbets from the Croatian Institute of History and I will be moderating and hosting this online event. Uh, this colloquium is part of the project European Origins of Modern Croatia, Transfer of Ideas on Political and Cultural Fields in the 18th and 19th Centuries. Uh, the project is led by Dr. Blasta Schwoger. Uh, it is being conducted at the Croatian Institute of History and financed by the Croatian Science Foundation. Uh, the objective of the project is to uh, research into the transfer and the reception of various ideas and the influence of ideas of European provenance in Croatia's political and cultural life in 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, which contributed to the shaping of Croatia's European identity and uh, its transformation into a modern state. Uh, the colloquia that we organized aimed to address the transfer of ideas from European political and cultural circles to the semi-peripheral periphery of their influence, uh, as well their acceptance, uh, non-acceptance or modifications. Uh, the current colloquium is the fifth in the series, uh, first two colloquia were dedicated to the political culture of Habsburg monarchy in the 19th century, the third one to the history of pedagogy in the uh, Habsburg monarchy, and the fourth one uh, on the women legal history. Uh, we were very happy to have the opportunity to host excellent academics from Austria, Hungary, Slovenia and Bulgaria. Uh, I'm certain that uh, today's colloquium on anti-epidemic measures will be of equal interest to the researchers in Croatia and beyond. Uh, and not only because it addresses a fairly, fairly uh, topical issue of epidemic control these days, uh, but also because of our two excellent lecturers whose research is very much dedicated to the subject and who will share with us uh, an interesting historical perspective to our contemporary concerns. Uh, various modernization processes uh, regarding anti-epidemic measures will be analyzed today, and the patterns of their implementation or modification will be questioned. Uh, before we start uh, with the lectures, I should also make some technical remarks uh, about the organization of this meeting. Uh, both presentations will be held in English, uh, as well as a discussion. The discussion will be held uh, after the both lectures, uh, when there will be enough time for questions. Uh, you can also choose to write your questions in the chat section during the presentations. Uh, so, uh, to begin with the program, uh, I am very happy to greet Dr. Sabine Jesner as our first lecturer. Uh, Dr. Jesner is a research fellow uh, and lecturer for Southeast uh, European history and anthropology at the University of Graz. Uh, her doctoral thesis examined uh, the early modern Habsburg border policy in the Transylvania military border, uh, where she focused on defense and plague prevention strategies. Uh, she is a head of Impact Fellow and heads uh, the third party project on Habsburg uh, battlefield medicine in the 18th century Southeastern Europe during, during the Ottoman Wars. A uh, member of the Society for uh, 18th Century Studies, Studies on Southeastern Europe uh, and the managing director of the Commission for History and Culture of the Germans in Southeastern Europe. Uh, in 2020, she received the Malageta Prize for the History of Medicine from the Austrian Academy of Studies for her studies uh, on the Habsburg Sanitary Cordon. Uh, her research interests uh, encompass the practice-oriented examination of Habsburg administration in Southeast Europe, uh, with a focus of military and civil societies under consideration of a medicine historical and historical anthropological approach. Uh, we are very happy to have the opportunity today to listen to her lecture on Imperial Health Management, uh, the Habsburg Border Quarantines. Uh, Sabina, the floor is yours. Uh, you can share the presentation. Thank you very much for your kind 
invitation and also your kind introduction. Thank you for that. I will share my screen one moment. I hope it works, yes. But, um, the last uh, two years, the, the fighting of COVID-19 have shown how pandemics shaped governmental procedures and infra infrastructures for sanitary reasons. Border closure, quarantine, and the surveillance of individuals became newly discovered in order to prevent the pandemic threat. For some of us, those methods to prevent the spread of disease re-emerged, but it's worth mentioning that some of those methods were not a novel procedure. The Habsburg border quarantines, also known as uh, the Habsburg Cordon Sanitaire, as institution of medical control over human movement and uh, border crossing can serve as a case study for that and will be in the center of attention during uh, this talk. The Habsburg Cordon Sanitaire functioned from the 18th century until long into the 19th century as an epidemical early warning system. These quarantine facilities served as a health bulwark against the bubonic plague and were constructed to offer a framework for medical inspections to see if those uh, transiting the border from the Ottoman Empire, as well as animals and goods, had been in contact uh, with any epidemic disease. Entering the monarchy was allowed solely by those facilities. Innovative was that the quarantine um, the, um, dining system was mandatory and uh, permanent. In contrast, we have to mention that quarantine and border closure for medical reasons were practiced also before. First, I will introduce you into the motives which were decisive for the establishment of the Habsburg border quarantines. Then I will focus on those quarantine stations as new governmental permanent institutions, and I will address some issues on the entanglement of effectiveness, medical knowledge transfer, and early modern ideas of security and protection for sanitary reasons within an early modern compos uh, composite state. So why these facilities um, have been installed at the external border? of the Habsburg monarchy. A significant, a significant motive for implementing intensified measures on medical grounds was linked with the Peace Treaty of Passarowitz in 1718, which formally ended the Habsburg Ottoman War. Some days after its ratification, a separate commercial and shipping treaty was signed between the emperor and the sultan to regulate prospective uh, trading terms between the empires, granting merchants uh, more freedom and protection from abuse. From the Habsburg point of view, the intensified enterprising spirit resulting from them, the declaration of Rijeka and Trieste as free boards, as well as the inception of the imperial privileged uh, oriental company led to more intense points of contact with both Ottoman subjects and thereby also with the Levantine plague. In addition, the Vionese court pursued new approaches in order to improve the living circumstances of the population and in a further step, the economic power. This uh, can be subsumed under the vast term of medicalization that reflects in better medical care for the whole population, more hospitals, more and better hospitals, and uh, better education for medical staff, but uh, was accompanied by intensified surveillance and control over the population. The so-called 
Medizinal, uh, Medical Police, Medizinal Polizei emerged from uh, that process. Since uh, the middle of the 18th century, we can speak of the Habsburg Cordon Sanitaire, which built on the already mentioned chain of quarantine stations on the terrain of the Habsburg military border. The quarantine stations were situated near major transport and trading routes, which served simultaneously as entry points into the monarchy from the Ottoman Empire. You can see on uh, the slide the Habsburg military border and quarantine stations in the second half of the 18th century. The border guards of the Habsburg military border monitored the border, the cordon militaire, and offered thereby the framework for the development of uh, the cordon militaire into a cordon sanitaire. The well-known quarantine legislation of the Venetian seaports influenced the black prevention policy of the monarchy and consequently the, the development of accompanying legislation. The sanitary regulation instructed, introduced by the Viennese uh, court built upon such maritime regulations, the establishment of a 40-day quarantine in 1726 at the Litorale Austria Corps followed the Venetian model and was adopted by the Habsburg authorities for Trieste, for instance. In order to ensure an effective monitoring mechanism, specific forms of individual identification became a functional control instrument in cross-border traffic. This was implemented by the introduction of various forms of passports by both the Ottoman and Habsburg authorities. The aim of this measure was clear, to track the places of departure, as well as determine the travel rules. Uh, the slide shows two different forms for recording entries. One, this older one, uh, from 1769 and uh, one from the early uh, from the early 19th century. We have to assume, however, that entry registers about Ottoman subjects, both are related to that Ottoman uh, subject, this one and, and this one. This is for um, other border crosses, crossers. It's called with mit Ausnahme der Türkin. We, can, we have to assume, however, that uh, those entry registers about Ottoman subjects were not uh, compiled solely for medical reasons. Consequently, we can find rubrics in these documents uh, which portend economic and other interests, as the Habsburg authorities also asked for the kind of trade and possible changes of affili affiliation Today, we would uh, say nationality. Medical surveillance strategies in turn made no exceptions regarding a class, thus the entry procedure as requested by the Viennese court did not uh, dis discern between the treatment of princes from the Danubian principalities, Ottoman bashers, or even higher ranking Habsburg officials or travelers and peasants had to spend a defined uh, time span in quarantine with the duration spe specified by the authorities in Vienna. The medical examination was done before the quarantine by a physician or surgeon under the eye of the director of the facility. I will quote one famous traveler who is more known for his fairy tales than his travel descriptions. The Danish writer Hans Christian Andersen traveled in the 1840s back from Greece with, via the quarantine uh, station Schupanek, located in the historical region of Panat, home to Denmark. He processed his 
experience of a 10-day quarantine, quarantine in his book, A Poet's Bazaar. I quote. Our entry into quarantine was a subject for a painter. Round about were wooden grown mountains and before a flat green plain where the artist could place the large vegans filled with our baggage, drawn by white oxen and driven by Wallachian peasants in white jackets and colossal hats hanging down over their shoulders. And then the mixed company of Turks, Greeks and Franks. Soldiers accompanied us for safe conduct. Our entrance was the merriest thing imaginable. We saw cannon, naked walls, large padlocks, rattling keys, quarantine officers who stepped respectfully aside that they might not come in contact with us. The first day in quarantine goes on excellently well. We get a good rest after traveling. The second, third and fourth day, we write letters. The fifth and sixth, we become accustomed to the place and read a good book, if we had one. But the seventh day, we are disaccustomed again and find that the seventh day, but not the whole seven days, ought to be a day of rest. I began to find it desperate. I will give you a second insight into the contemporaneous perception of quarantine stations. Robert Walsh, an Irish reverend, described in the end of the 1820s his 21 uh, days of isolation in the quarantine station in Rottentum in Transylvania on his way home from Constantinople, where he was employed at the, uh, at the British Embassy. Groups of these peasants from the Wallachian side were frequently, frequently shut up in large huts in the quarantine below during our detention. The meat they brought with them for their support was hung around the building so that they resembled shambles, and much of it seemed so stale as to be unfit to food. Food, very poor. They were very merry, and when led down to the river in groups to get water, they sprinkled it on one another like children and made the valley ring with their mirth. A body of 200, including women and children, had arrived when there was no shelter, when there was no place to shelter them. They were bivouacked of necessity on the banks of the river, and after suffering exceedingly from wet and cold, in very inclement weather, they were suffered to proceed after 10 days' detention. Having had their clothes previously passed through water, they had come from a part of the country, we were told, where plague was said to be, rage, to be raging, and they were clad in dirty sheepskins with the wool on, a dress most likely to retain infection. The quarantine, quarantine period, period uh, depended on the vicinity of the ep epidemic threat, during the second half of the 18th century based on the Generale Normativum in Re Sanitatis from January 1770, the most important uh, sanitary regulation for the monarchy until the, the 1830s, we had three periods, 40, 28, and 21 days. The definition was done by the Viennese court, the sanitary court a commission, the Sanitätshof Commission, and with 1776, uh, the Olic War Council, the Hofkriegsrat, with the Sovereign. And followed the, the, followed the information sent in by the local sanitary commissions, the Sanitätskommissionen, uh, in the provinces. During quarantine, diverse purification methods based on contemporaneous medical knowledge and expertise uh, were applied. 
the focus was laid on fumigation as well as airing and washing of goods and animals. Architectural plans uh, for different quarantine stations reveal huge structural variety among uh, these uh, facilities. Those uh, plans offer an insight concerning the distribution of buildings and the infrastructure needs. In addition, uh, some details about the practical life and uh, spatial circumstances within the quarantine area can be derived from that. I will show you some of this. This plan, for instance, illustrated uh, or was called uh, ideal uh, idle plan for quarantine station. We can see here. This is the entry into the quarantine station. This is the so called uh, visitation room where the medical surveillance uh, uh, took place. We can See here the flat of the physician. We can see here, here this is the, uh, the first floor, the rooms of the director. And for instance, important could be uh, a chapel. We have um, here the, the rooms for the people in seclusion. We have um, here sort of magazines for the goods and so on. Um, we have oh, we have here the rooms for the assisting staff for the servants, which uh, were really needed for the uh, purification process. But this is the, the sort of the, the ideal plan. This is a plan from um, Sluin, and we can see it's not that uh, ideal. But we also have uh, here the, the rooms for the, the people in seclusion. We have here the flat for the director of the contumats. Contumats is the contra, uh, contemporaneous word for, um, for quarantine uh, stations. Um, here we have the, the room of a clerk and uh, the rooms of the, the physician, for instance. Um, yeah, sure. And the next one, this is the, uh, the quarantine, quarantine station in Brot. And this is uh, an interesting one because everything what you can see in yellow here should be uh, restructured. For instance, there was needed uh, new magazines, like you can see on uh, number six. They call it in German Warenstall and so on. The last one from this uh, uh, illustrations is the quarantine, quarantine station in um, Sik Gümes, you can see in, in Transylvania. I have uh, this uh, map from the Josefinischen Landesaufnahme. You can see here the quarantine station, also the 36th arm, which means the customs office. You can see in green, the border, the external, external border of the Habsburg monarchy toward Moldova. And you can see, hopefully, these small red points here and here. For instance, these are the cordon posts for the military border soldiers. And the area of the, the, the quarantine station, this one, is, for instance, this one here. And we have, we have uh, and these are more or less a defensive infrastructure, stations for the military border and so on. We have a cemetery here. And uh, in this area, we have, uh, in the middle of the, of the of the Contumats, the quarantine station, you can see a church. In this area, we have the, the rooms for the, the physician and also the visitation room for the investigation of the uh, people. 
And in this area, we have flats for the people in seclusion. We have magazines, we have rooms for servants. And here we have the, the rooms and the stables for the priest and the director, for instance. Um, contemporary theories on infection were undeniable responsible for the strict organizational procedure, in particular the miasma theory which dates from classical Greece. According to this theory, disease causation relates to environmental emanations, gases or miasmas, Miasma was considered to be a noxious form of bad air, exhalations from swamps, marshes, stagnant water, and winds were some of the causes for the corruption of air. On the other hand, the contagion theory was part of the medical discourse, which was based on the assumption that a contagion was carried by unknown entering particles especially during uh, the 19th century supporters of the contagion theory promoted quarantine measures while proponents um, of the miasma theory assessed quarantine as inefficient because in their approach, pestilential air was the pathogen. The measures undertaken in uh, hospital quarantine stations encompassed a combination of both theories and the, um, and the contagion or miasma as well as contagion. For example, the miasma uh, theoretical approach is visible through the purification method of uh, fumigation or the simple airing of personal belongings and uh, commercial goods. While the contagion theory appears in isolation and the prevention of physical contact under any circumstances. That the incubation period for bubonic plague calculated from the day of infection should be um, a maximum of seven days is today scientifically established and well understood. However, um, this uh, important fact was not recognized during the 18th century and this uh, provoked extraordinarily long quarantine periods. It is uh, worth mentioning that uh, the Cordon Sanitaire was not a very uh, lucrative business for the Viennese court, even though it was uh, based on a self-financing system, which meant that the expenses uh, for the quarantine stations, staff salaries and maintenance costs were to be covered by the so-called purification taxes, Reinigungssteuern, demanded for the cleaning uh, of commercial goods. And this is an overview on purification taxes and costs for quarantine stations in 1776. You can see uh, visibly is uh, the difference between the income, which you can see here, and uh, by the taxes and uh, the needs, which you can see here. Even uh, for Hungary and Croatia, Banat and Transylvania, the, the purification taxes were not high enough to cover all the costs for quarantine stations. Based um, on the regulation of uh, 1770, the sanitary treatment and duration of quarantine depended on the degree of danger expected. 42 days if neighboring uh, provinces were infected, 28 days if there was an outbreak somewhere else in the Ottoman Empire, and 21 days under normal circumstances. Additionally, total entry bans 
entry travel bans uh, were possible and enforced in very precarious times. The length of quarantine, quarantine depended upon the assessed level of danger. The latter also influenced uh, the manpower of border soldiers along the cordon, which increased when there was an enhanced uh, risk of epidemic. It should be pointed out yet again that the, the source of the disease infection and transmission was incompletely investigated, that the red flea nexus was uh, unknown. However, some contemporaneous, like the physician Adam Chenot, did possess the right instinct to clarify how the infection and the zoonotic so, so path of a transmission functioned. Chenot's uh, expertise rested primarily on his experience while fighting the bubonic uh, plague in Transylvania, as well as his own suffering from plague in a Brashov Kronstadt. Chenot recognized that such long periods of quarantine were responsible for the obstruction of commerce. Chenot achieved, uh, achieved a great success with his elaboration, the Einleitung zu den Verbauungsanstalten wieder die Best, that was announced in 1785 as an official instruction, but not on a legal footing, for the general commands of the military border. The instruction included the abolishment of the first quarantine period. This meant in effect that when no cases of the plague had occurred in neighboring provinces, then no quarantine was necessary when crossing the border. The medical uh, debate by both supporters of the contagionist and anti-contagionist theories remained controversial. The anti-contagionists became more influential in the 1820s and fought for less strict sanitary regulations and against uh, quarantining. Tate and Night, direct pestilential contagion, as well as the efficacy quarantine and criticized the expansive maintenance of quarantine stations and the resulting trade restrictions. It is um, an indisputable fact that bubonic plague spared most parts of Europe after the erection of sanitaire in southeastern Europe. Incidentally, other factors influenced the impact of the cordon sanitaire in the 1830s. First, the change in opinion of the high board, which now supported the establishment of a quarantine system on its own territory. And second, the recently installed quarantine measures in the Danubian principalities by the Russians. In 1837, the best Polizei Ordnung, the, the, the Blake Law, was a new regulation enacted within the Habsburg monarchy. From a medical point of view, we cannot find any innovative changes in this Blake Law when comparing it with the last regulation in 1770. Whether the quarantine procedure remained the same, even though it was described more comprehensively and multifariously. Greater effectiveness can be attributed to the, redu to the reduction of quarantine periods, zero days, 10 days, and 20 days. This was based on the mentioned initiative of Adam Chenot. The Habsburg Cordon Sanitaire was of great importance until the signing of the so-called Donau Schifffahrts Act, the Danube Shipping Protocol by the Ottoman Empire, Bavaria, Württemberg, and the Habsburg Monarchy in 1857. And this contract included the agreement that for all ships on the Danube, no quarantine measure were, measure were necessary if during the last 12 months, no sign of plague 
had been recognized on the river side of the Danube. Along with this regulation, the Quadun Sanitia lost its compelling necessity. In the military border, the quarantine station had been re replaced here and there by the so-called Rastel. Uh, this uh, term describes a wooden barrier, which made a simplified and less strict controlled uh, trade possible. This uh, gradual downgrading implies that the Habsburg sanitary cordon lost much uh, significance. And with the final abolishment of the Habsburg military border in 1881, it appeared that terrestrial quarantines would uh, disappear. In uh, conclusion, we can uh, classify the Habsburg quarantines as a successful instrument in order to contain the spread of diseases because uh, there has been no further major bubonic plague outbreaks in the monarchy and also in uh, Central Europe. This was done uh, by the surveillance of mobility as well as the method of quarantine as a uh, at uh, already at the external border. Most of the border crossers respected the burdensome norms related to the mandatory practice of quarantine. Then again, we have indications of multifaceted variants of smuggling and illegal border uh, crossings of humans. However, the Habsburg sanitary cordon contributed by creating new medical spaces, the quarantine station, to a positive outcome of the public health policy of the Viennese court. Although uh, the, the measures based on the limitation of uh, individual rights for the benefit of the health of the society and the fact that uh, generated new knowledge as in the case of Adam Chenot, found its way very slow in, into practice. To this uh, day, the method of quarantine has been a proven instrument of securing health during pandemics. Simultaneously, we made the control of external borders and the medical premises part of an effective policy of the containment of infectious diseases. Thank you for your attention. So, Sabina, uh, thank you very much for this exciting insight uh, into uh, the Habsburg anti-epidemic measures on the borders of the monarchy, uh, and also various problems that emerged in implementing these measures. Uh, I have uh, conducted only a very modest research on the sanitary cordon or cordon sanitaire in the Croatian parts of the military border, and uh, uh, I was now excited to hear more about your research. Uh, I would have a ton of questions, uh, and some of them I will be free to ask during the discussion part. Thank you. Uh, now to keep up with the, uh, with the schedule. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome Dr. Kristina Pulizovic. Uh, Dr. Pulizovic is uh, Associate Professor at the History Department of the uh, Croatian Catholic University in Zagreb. Uh, she finished her doctoral, uh, doctoral studies at the University of Dubrovnik and her research interests encompass historical demography, women history and social history of medicine. Uh, her very interesting book on the history of midwifery in Dubrovnik and Dalmatia during the Habsburg rule brings together these historical disciplines. Uh, recently, she focuses her research on the history of epidemics. Uh, Dr. Pulizovic is author of uh, various scientific papers on this subject and a researcher uh, on the projects financed by the Croatian Science Foundation and uh, Historical Department of the Croatian Academy of Sciences and Arts in Dubrovnik. Uh, today, uh, she is uh, going to, uh, to talk uh, 
about anti-epidemic measures in Dalmatia during the 19th century. Uh, Christina, please, you may start with your lecture. Um, thank you, Ivana, very much for the introduction. And um, hello to all that, that's listening and watching. Um, I will just take a little time to share the screen, just one moment. I have a short PowerPoint presentation. Um, one moment. Yeah. All right. I hope it's visible to everyone. Yes. All right. Well, I will describe the anti-epidemic um, actions during the long period of peace from the beginning of the second Austrian administration in Dalmatia, 1815, until the end of the 19th century. Um, my short lecture is based on various proclamations, instructions, orders, advertisements, and appeals through which the Dalmatian government communicated to its population. The documents are all kept in the state archives in Zadar, looking a bit like this. Um, integration of Dalmatia in larger state union reflected on the managing the health issues as well. Early modern communal institutions were replaced. Although the Dalmatian government passed and printed the health regulations in the provincial capital, city of Zadar, considering the context of their political position within the Habsburg monarchy, they followed the health policy of Vienna. Second Austrian administration implemented their own health policy in Dalmatia. In the first few decades, central government tried to regulate public health, I quote, as it was in other parts of monarchy. For that purpose, specific regulations and instructions for medical personnel were printed and passed on every five to 10 years, which were in line with the medical police concept, the strict surveillance of public health. Sanitary officers, public physicians, and other public servants were traditionally engaged in observing the epidemic outbreaks, and they had duties in quarantines. Specially, special sanitary department was in charge of epidemiological control in harbors and in maritime traffic. However, the greatest caution regarding epidemics outbreaks Austrian authorities took on the long border with Ottoman Empire, that is Bosnia and Herzegovina. Due to complete lack of anti-epidemic measures and fatalistic comprehension of disease and death, Ottoman Empire represented, represented constant danger for spreading diseases, especially plague. In the time of taking over the province for the second time, Austrian administration administrators faced the threat of the plague epidemic that ravaged Bosnia and Herzegovina during the 1814 and 1815. The plague eventually broke out in the Makarska and Dubrovnik hinterland in June 1815 and lasted in Dalmatia until 1816. At that time, Austrian government applied the same rules for sanitary cordon as once valid for the sanitary cordon organized along Croatian military border. Level of precaution and duration of quarantine were graded depending on the situation on the other side of the border. The protocol on the border was strictly defined and were conducted by sanitary officers, border military officers, and various outsourced staff. Besides the prescribed rules that should be followed, the documents contains description of the plague and its transmission written in a very simple manner, understandable to uneducated rural population and poorly educated border officers. The epidemic of 1815 and 1816 was the last plague outbreak in Croatia, in Dalmatia also, Still, precaution on border continued until the 1850, when the quarantine for travelers, merchants, and merchant goods were canceled. 
it was announced then that the situation with the plague in the Ottoman Empire, I quote, was good. While plague epidemics died down, Europe faced waves of newly imported contagion from Asia, cholera. While anti-plague measures were based on centuries of experience, fight against cholera until the 1860s was characterized by a global debate on, on contagious or non-contagious nature of disease, which affected measures taken. The Council of the Best Monarchy Physicians decided, like their European colleagues, that the cholera is not contagious, that freed trade and merchant goods from the of the quarantine. However, other comprehensive precautions have been adopted. Instructions for procedures in cases of cholera epidemics issued in Dalmatia during the century were under the significant significant influence of the concept of medical police. Sanitary officers and physicians in the public service had a number of responsibilities in monitoring the cholera epidemic and the data collecting. They monitored urban and more densely populated areas by focusing on the lifestyle on the of the population. They paid attention on overcrowding, uncleanliness, alcoholism, etc. The poor were closely supervised, as well as inns and lodgings. Physicians had to submit comprehensive reports on a weekly basis, containing the number of infected, dead, and many other various data. From 1860s until the 1918, provinces in Habsburg monarchy gained autonomy in internal affairs. During that period, Public health care was competence of the Dalmatian government and parliament. A special health care, um, sorry, health council for the management of public health in the province has been established in Zadar. The council collected reports from local health officials and issued instructions and orders regarding the province health matters. In addition, in 1874, a part of the health affairs was transferred to the jurisdictions of the municipalities, which was a significant change in relations to the former centralist system. In this sense, the management of epidemics has passed mainly to the local authorities, districts and municipalities. And uh, specific anti-epidemic measures, including quarantines, have been adopted at the local level. Well, um, there's a map showing the long border with Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, where the sanitary cordon was also organized. Um, okay. Regarding the preventive anti-epidemic actions, the priests were of the highest importance. The Austrian authorities saw them as the main agents for promoting the government's public health regulations. Population of Dalmatia were most, mostly rural, poor, uneducated and illiterate. And while they were traditionally distrustful towards the urban gents, nobility and citizens alike, they had respect and trust for their priests. The government therefore obliged priests to read and interpret anti-epidemic proclamations after Sunday Masses, when there were the most people in the church. The parishioners had to explain, I quote, kindly and in good faith, in a very clear way, so that everyone could understand habits and the way of life that were taught to favor the spread of the epidemic. Emotional stability was considered important in disease prevention. So in addition to informing and teaching, priests were required to spiritually empower and encourage their parishioners during the epidemics. Also the behavior of the clergy was of great importance. So it was sometimes prescri prescribed how the priests themselves should behave, for example, uh, the 1831 disease prevention instructions instructed priests to warn the population of 
the personal hygiene and cleanliness of their clothes. The priest's appearance, that is, his own hygiene habits, says the documents, would speak more than his words. The priest's duties regarding vaccination um, were in line in their role in society. For example, they accompanied doctors or health officials when visiting houses to make a list of people to be vaccinated. They had to compile a list of newborns in their parishes every three months, which also served the purpose of vaccination. Every three months, they were required to read from the altar the names of those who had died of smallpox and at the same time, I quote, briefly and clearly warn the parents of their duty before God and before the king, convincing them to accept help, meaning vaccination, to save their children's lives. Still, doctors and surgeons, sanitary officers and the local administrations had the most extensive task in vaccination process. They collected data on vaccinated and unvaccinated, took care of sufficient vaccine supplies, vaccinated children in orphanages. Once a year, they organized vaccinations in the places they were in charge of. Finally, they were required to corroborate all of this with detailed written reports. For the purpose of encouraging vaccination, the government sometimes used harsh psychological psychological pressures. Local government officials had to put an inscription in, and I quote, huge letters on front door of the home of patients infected with smallpox. Um, this inscription read, I quote, the smallpox appeared in the family of, name and surname, living in this house, end of quotation. After that, measures of isolation of infected family were carried out. Local administrators were required to post on the bulletin boards the names and surnames of persons who had died of smallpox, emphasizing their own responsibility. It was pointed out that, again, I quote, these were individual, individuals stubborn in their misconceptions, who rather let their sons and adopted orphans die than to use the help to preserve them through vaccination given to them by the government. Preventive proposals for the case of plague mainly contained instructions based on contagion theory and experience. In addition to general and brief advice for a healthy life, uh, they advised caution in commercial and personal contacts, especially at borders, and timely seg segregation of the sick. With bacteriological research and the knowledge that the incubation lasts from two to seven days, 10 days quarantine and isolation of patients remained the best available way to combat the plague epidemics well into the late 19th century. On the other hand, cholera prevention guidelines co contained much more extensive advice on diet and lifestyle in general. In an attempt to eradicate the common belief that alcohol consumption, pipe smoking, and hearty diet protect against the disease. Moderation has been strongly and repeatedly recommended in every segment of private life. The diet should have been based on fresh foods, especially meat, well-cooked, immature fruits and green raw vegetables, mushrooms, clams, rancid food in general should be avoided. Special emphasis is placed on dietary customs specific to Dalmatia. There are many examples. Um, here's one. Poorly baked bread that often remained unbaked in the middle due to the way it was baked under the baking bell. The other local customs, or I will say necessities of life, were also pointed out as harmful, such as 
sleeping outdoors, especially at night and on bare ground. Living with domestic animals, too much or too little physical effort and exposure to cold and moisture. The body had to be kept clean, dry and warm and the living space clean and ventilated. In commercial and personal contacts, caution included screening passengers and their luggage, traders and merchandise on public transport, in ports and at train stations, especially on lines coming from infected areas. Disinfection of premises, objects and people at the time of cholera outbreak was prescribed as an important preventive action. From the first outbreaks of cholera in Europe, it was clear that um, it affected the poor the most. Moreover, poverty was understood as one of the main causes of cholera. Therefore, poverty elevation activities were seen as a preventive action against cholera. The threat of cholera was promoted as a good opportunity to express, I quote, togetherness and love of neighbor. So the government called for protection and assistance to the poor by caring for orphanages, shelters and soup kitchens. If the epidemic broke out, despite, despite numerous disease prevention guidelines, as often did, state authorities would try to curb it with the restrictive measures. Strictest measures were imposed on the border with Ottoman Empire. Crossing the border with the Ottoman Empire, that is sanitary cordon without being quarantined and inspected by sanitary officials was a serious violation of the Health Act. It was also considered a criminal offense to assist in illegal border crossing, forgery of health documents and admissions of persons traders or their merchandise to inns. These offenses were punished with five to 10 years of hard dungeon. And in circumstances where the per perpetrator would be responsible for large scale epidemic and many deaths, the court could impose a maximum sentence of 20 years. The punishment in some circumstances could be milder, in which case the offender could be punished only by beating. However, violating the sanitary cordon also posed a greater risk than the dungeon. Guards on the sanitary cordon had the authority to shoot anyone who tried to cross the border secretly or violently, or anyone who did not respond to a call to stop. Officers, guards and sanitary staff were also required to perform their duties at the border responsibly and fairly. They were for forbidden to receive any so-called gifts, that is bribery, to allow individuals to cross the border without enduring full-time quarantine. They were forbidden to issue false health certificates. Severe penalties were provided for those these uh, offenses, especially if the offense, uh, offenders were bribed, in which case they could be sentenced up to 20 years in prison. Violation of sanitary measures at the border was also punishable by the most severe punishment, shooting, uh, which could have occurred if the offenses had been planned despite the knowledge of the ban and if they had resulted in dangerous consequences. Despite the law and severe penalties, there were frequent violations of sanitary regulation and illegal border crossings. In practice, it appears that the offenses were not punished as prescribed. There are many examples in the documents, I'll name one. When the plague broke out in an Albanian Peshalik in 1824, the government raised the level of caution, emphasizing that the numerous violation on the sanitary cordon would no longer be tolerated. The Habsburg monarchy, like the most European governments, banned compulsory quarantine for cholera cases. 
uh, not for plague cases on the cholera, enabling free trade, but left in force a number of other restrictions that equally affected the freedom and dignity of the individual. The poor, especially those without a home of their own, could be involuntarily hospitalized in temporary hospital, hospitals established especially for cholera patients. In addition, the sanitary service, health commissions and local government had broad powers to conduct detailed inspections to follow preventive provisions related to the sale of food and beverages and housing. Public institutions, pubs and inns were inspected, as well as private homes, with the military sometimes being involved. The strict traffic control has been prescribed, a physician examined passengers and their luggage, and the traveler infected with cholera would be banned from continuing his journey and would have to be hospitalized. The population was also subject uh, to severe anti-epidemic measures as soon as the first cases of cholera appeared. Events with a large number of people, such as festivals and pilgrimages, assemblies and meetings, fairs were all banned. Schools were also closed. Begging and door-to-door -door sales were regularly among the prohibitions in the time of cholera. And um, as an illustration, I have uh, this, this short um, cut from from um, regulation of sanitary cordon, um, um, I would like to uh, um, quickly read for Croatian speakers. Uh, this is uh, the one that uh, allows guards to shoot anyone who, who tries to cross the border without stopping. So, za otpriti se kugi, straže imaju zapovid, zategnuti ispuške protiva svakomu ko bi pristupio mejaše od sanitadi i ne bi poslušao kada mu narede da odstupi ili bi se njimi protivio silom. All right, so um, to conclude this presentation, I would like to emphasize three things that I think were characteristically for management of epidemics in 19th century Croatia. First, um, until the 60s, healthcare was centralized and anti-epidemic measures were implemented from Vienna. After that time, healthcare and anti-epidemic measures and decisions were in the hands of the provincial authorities, that is um, characteristic. And until the end of the 19th century, the anti-epidemic action taken were in line with the medical police concept, no matter um, who made the decisions, Vienna or Zadar, uh, state uh, authorities or provincial authorities. Um, and uh, the last one of my co conclusions, <laughs> the anti-epidemic measures uh, were in accordance with the medical knowledge of the time. So, um, thank you very much for your attention. And So thank you, Christina, very much for this insightful presentation uh, and for sharing with us uh, your research on the forms and procedures regarding anti-epidemic measures in Dalmatia. Uh, for me, it was uh, especially very interesting to hear how the authorities dealt with the infected subjects, uh, as well as with the subjects that were too stubborn to accept public recommendations. Uh, the case of Sting all the more so uh, because in this territory various influences were brought together. It's Mediterranean surroundings, the tra tradition of Venetian rule, and finally the house of domination in the 19th century. Uh, well, uh, now that we have heard both, both lectures, uh, I would like to open the discussion. Well, uh, first, I will use my position as a moderator to heat up this, the discussion by asking a few questions. Uh, 
Sabina and Christina, my first question uh, is directed to both of you. Uh, it concerns the sources and the possibility of the research. Uh, in my experience, uh, provisions regarding anti-epidemic measures issued by the court or local authorities uh, make most of the available sources that we can find uh, in the archives. Uh, by analyzing these sources, we can learn a lot of how the system was conceived. Uh, or however, sources that could tell us how the system was implemented or has it been questioned or altered are less common. Uh, for example, I know that all quarantine sites had to submit regular reports to the authorities, but such reports in case of Croatia are very rare to find. Uh, so my question is uh, for both of you. Uh, what type of sources do you uh, use for questioning the reach, uh, the reach of uh, official provisions uh, or even to determine the existence of new knowledge made in the semi-periphery or periphery uh, or uh, new practices that were used here? Should I start first? Please, Sabine. Yeah, thank you very much for that interesting uh, question. And yes, uh, you have addressed uh, uh, a problem because uh, the source material on the Cordon Sanitaire of the Habsburg monarchy for the 18th century is uh, scattered. Uh, it seems that uh, they were not that interested in medical uh, knowledge. Uh, from the provinces, because all of these reports, I show you that uh, forms, uh, we cannot find some kind of this. And uh, for instance, uh, after finishing a quarantine stay, uh, the uh, people in seclusion received a so-called Sanitätsfede, which means a passport that the quarantine is finished. And uh, we have nothing. I've never. I've only found the forms for that, but never anything of that. And uh, the aim of the Viennese uh, court was to control that, but I'm not sure if uh, this was not done because uh, sometimes in uh, Vienna we have not a lot of material directly on the Cordon Sanitaire. I think the there are only three boxes, and one of these boxes includes these pictures I show you, that's these illustrations and actual architectural plans. But you uh, can find, uh, you have to find other ways. For instance, you can work through the documents of the Hofkriegsrat, and you can also go through the documents of the single provinces. Uh, what I have done in the case, uh, more specif specific for Transylvania, because this was part of my doctoral Thesis and the Banat, and thank you for you, uh, for Croatia. You did that for Croatia, I think so. And yes, it's uh, difficult. And I think what's always is really important because as you said before, these instructions, these official norms and decrees, we have uh, a lot of them, but uh, the most important question is, uh, this is why I quoted this uh, autobi autobiographical comments of Andersen and um, Awash is how differs the norm from the reality. And this is difficult for us to answer. And this is a problem because we have more or less no autobiographical information. What we have, what we have and what is also uh, useful, we have uh, with the Finanz- und Hofkammer Archiv, this one was responsible for the stuff in these quarantine stations. We have names and sometimes we have a sort of uh, um, curriculum by T and so on, so that uh, we can receive more insights in the life of the quarantine. And what we have also from this uh, um, economic approach um, that uh, uh, the, the, the how the commerce was handled and handicapped in these quarantine stations, for instance, something like that. But it's 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 difficult to to find good material, and I have really a lot of questions, and I'm not sure if I will ever find an answer for them. So, 
yes, thank you very much. Yes, it, it is the same problem in Croatia too. Where I have, I have uh, looked through uh, many of uh, uh, local archives and I, I, I still couldn't find any, uh, uh, any reports. And I know mm. they had to do these reports and they had to send them to Vienna, but I, I, I couldn't find them. So, uh, but, but it, it would be a great source for uh, uh, for the, for the for the practice of physicians or yeah, uh, yeah. surgeons there. Or, but but they are really I've rare to find. I've only seen it cases, and uh, this um, is related uh, to your uh, entrance uh, introduction, Christina. As you said, peace time. I have uh, some cases found, but only for Transylvania during war times in the bordering uh, Ottoman, uh, um, in the bordering Moldova and, uh, or Valachia. Um, and, uh, but, and there are written names and so on. And, and also uh, women are dangable, which is really rare. And yeah, this is only, but this is only during a uh, war time that the border is uh, controlled that I think the border was controlled, but uh, the documents are not uh, dangable for us, unfortunately, anymore. <laughs> so, Christina, have you been more lucky with? with... Um, I, I have to say, I um, I just only have recently um, stepped on on this kind of sources and um, um, came into the knowledge of existence of sanitary cordon in Dalmatia. So, uh, so the, the first sources are always the, this one um, institutional. So we, we have to uh, somehow analyze them thoroughly, the first, and then, um, then uh, search for the others. Um, I'm, I, I think I saw something in Zadar Archive, but um, that, that will wait for some time. And um, um, on the other hand, I wouldn't uh, call uh, this kind of sources, the gov governmental ones, um, so limiting. I think they, they offer much to, um, much to analyze, much to know from them, because um, as I mentioned in, in my um, lecture, um, for example, um, in 1816, they, are, um, they banned and frequently repeated mm -hmm. month after month, do not violate sanitary cordon, uh, border crossings are illegal without quarantine. So we can uh, be certain that it was violated, that the um, law was broke and uh, that was um, big holes in, in these systems. Um, for the other um, uh, issues as well, vaccination, um, regularly uh, they, they um, uh, describe um, situation in which they, um, in which they describe uh, how um, population is in, in refuses to vaccinate or, um, or sometimes the doctors and surgeons refuses to do their part of job. So um, there are some limitations, but I, I think there are also an opportunities to find more, more than it says. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, uh, we do know, but by this uh, continuation of some provisions, we we can be certain that many anti-epidemic rules have uh, been violated. Uh, uh, Christina, you have also mentioned limited implementations of uh, punishment. Uh, have you found uh, the records of such violations and? Uh, what were the consequences, actually? And uh, did it differ if a person was, for example, from a noble origin or, or an officer? Mm. No, no. For, um, um, unfortunately, I didn't find any uh, evidence of, mm -hmm. of such um, practice. 
Um, I assume it should be um, examine the um, court cases in our house. For, for that, for for this time, I only um, uh, went through the government instruction and, and law legislation of of anti-epidemic measures. Okay, thank you, uh, Sabina. And you, uh, I have found uh, for, for uh, quarantine science, uh, I have found only uh, limited proof that, that yeah. these punishments could be. Uh, for example, yes. I found yeah. some uh, uh, some some quarantine uh, director from Zemun, I think, uh, was sentenced to jail because uh, because he let some people. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but I have also found uh, a proof that. Uh, some uh, officers and nobles from uh, from Croatia um, uh, went uh, to, the, to the to the Ottoman uh, inside the Ottoman border without uh, uh, without the quarantine, mm -hmm. uh, but they were not punished. Yeah. So I think uh, I think with 1766 we have this first really really strict um, instruction. Uh, with uh, hanging to death and so on, this military. Um, but I've never found any cases because I'm sure that all the border um, border guards, perhaps uh, if they are knowing someone or had a family contact with border crossers, that uh, they wouldn't bring them back to the quarantine station or for um, something like that, yeah. Uh, it's quite difficult. Um, yes, I have uh, found some indications that, uh, the, that the people were sent it back because we have in this more information on this um, all day border crossing during the beginning of the 19th century. And also over the commercial way, I found indications that, for instance, the, there existed new ways of transfer. For instance, uh, that um, uh, merchants uh, put uh, their uh, um, um, goods into the quarantine. And from the other side, uh, his, the colleagues of them or partners anyway, took them with them. So the person, um, must not be must not have to go in quarantine and uh, the commerce was uh, possible in that way but uh, it's I think it's really difficult this is a, a huge problem investigating such a, a topic because these are the really interesting uh, question how was the functioning really and there are so less hints how it really works I think uh, both of them is uh, was in practice that uh, there was a lot of crime that uh, that uh, illegal uh, border crossing was not sentenced. But uh, on the other hand, we had to keep in mind that uh, our cont uh, contemporaneous um, were really afraid of the plague. Yeah, and it was a common knowledge that uh, the plague is horrible and. The plague was present in their life. Uh, um, sometimes when I'm talking about uh, that to, uh, to my students in the last uh, uh, two years, I remind them how they feel or how they felt uh, during the first uh, periods uh, of COVID-19. This is this, that kind of fear, because in that uh, time, there was no awareness how the way of transmission and infection and so on happens. And I think we should, uh, this idea, bring back when we investigate bubonic plague in the 18th century, because threat, fear are also important in the way how humans um, are dealing with uh, such norms, perhaps. Well, thank you, thank you both. Uh, uh, we, we have a question in chat from uh, our colleague, Dr. Teodora Shek uh, Bernatic. Uh, uh, I will uh, I'll read it. Uh, uh, 
Thank you both for very interesting, uh, very interesting presentations. Uh, Christina said something uh, about the procedure. Uh, just a minute uh, about the procedure with the infected travelers who would be banned from continuing to travel uh, and or hospitalized. Uh, what happened to those who developed symptoms during the quarantine? Was there some protocol in how to deal with them? Uh, what were the protection measures for physicians and border guards, that is for the agents uh, of the medical police? A question for both speakers. Right, well, um, in these instructions, it's not specified, but um, from my other readings and <laughs> things I, I have um, um, researched um, earlier, um, they have been taken care of in the facility they they were um, sent to. Um, and for the doctors, surgeons, uh, and sanitary officers, um, they used uh, some um, usual means to uh, fight and uh, protect themselves. So in early 19th century, those were a uh, special diet, um, uh, protection of their body. Um, in some instructions, uh, um, special outfit is uh, for those uh, sanitary inspectors. Uh, special out outfit is prescribed. It's uh, waxed. Um, uh, gloves are uh, gloves are um, um, uh, regularly used, and uh, some cloth. Uh, that covers mouth and nose. Cloth were, were usually was uh, dipped in vinegar. So um, that also was, uh, these means were also um, used by the end of the 19th century, including after the uh, bacteriological knowledge of through uh, causes of cholera and plague. So yeah, yes, they they had some some mechanisms to to fight and to prevent themselves. Also, um, sorry. Um, also, uh, everywhere it was uh, pointed out that emotional stability was very uh, very important. Even so, for uh, doctors, surgeons, sanitary officers, they had to be. Uh, and stay calm and um, uh, usually by, by the end of the 19th century, their secularization of society took uh, um, greater impact. Uh, by that time, um, these instructions usually uh, advised um, religion um, means to, to settle the soul down. <laughs> Thank you, Sabina. Yeah, what I can add in the, that uh, concerning that question is that we have no hints for a sort of uh, protective uniform for uh, um, surgeons and physicians and uh, servants in this uh, quarantine stations. But I think the procedure itself speaks for itself because um, the first step uh, if uh, someone arrived at the quarantine station, I showed you this uh, visitationszimmer. This was a uh, own room for the visitation, the surveillance of the um, of the person. And in this uh, visitationszimmer, this was uh, shared in two parts, so that there the, the aim was to prohibit uh, any kind of bodily contact. And what we know is that there existed, for instance, really long uh, instruments that uh, this uh, could be done. Uh, this could be a way of protection. And the second way is uh, one of the most important um, a medicine or a medical historian for the Habsburg monarchy and the, eight, the long 18th century is Erna Lesky, or was, uh, unfortunately, Leanna Lesky, and she explored some cases how the, the, the purification servants had to deal with the goods 
And uh, for instance, a ship wool was really was recognized as extraordinary uh, problematic because they had the long fur or, or within the long fur, the bad air uh, could hit themselves really good because and they were recognized as, as really, really, really um, um, problematic. And uh, the instruction, what we have on that is that the servants had to sleep in uh, magazines with these balls. Uh, Ball spine, I think. What's the two? Uh, a clot or a bale, yeah, it's, it's fine. A ball of this um, uh, ship, ship wool. And every day they had to put a naked arm in the balls. <laughs> to, and this. if they uh, remained uh, healthy, then it's fine. And if not, not. But most of the time it seems they stayed healthy. So this is a yeah a way yeah. to how to handle uh, epidemic diseases and yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, thank you both, Sabina. I will have to ask you later something about the servants. Okay. Uh, but but first, I would like to give a chance to to other participants if they have some uh, questions. Please raise a hand, hand who has. Well, no, what, while they're thinking, I will, I will ask this question. Uh, uh, well, uh, on these quarantine sites, uh, besides the administration, surgeons, physicians, and so on, uh, there were uh, actually, a lot of lot of servants who actually had to had to go, undergo a quarantine with an individual passengers, uh, 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 or to clean their goods. Uh, so they, they were local people, I suppose. Uh, and do you know if uh, they were often affected on duty, uh, and how they were treated by the state if they were affected? So was there, was there actually a shortage of people who wanted to work in quarantines? Did you find some, some sources related to that? Well, I've, I've uh, found uh, some sources that, uh, uh, that these servants were granted uh, with some, uh, some extra pension, mm -hmm. of how it was called, if they were infected, but, but not, not too many of these sources. So yes, I, I've also found that mm -hmm. I cannot remember exactly the term. They are called the two classes of servants, mm -hmm. and uh, and I think it's later. It's in the beginning. I, I think I found that in the Blake Law regulation, not before. I'm not sure about that. Mm -hmm. And yes, they received more money for that, and. Uh, I have more information in that uh, for the Transylvanian section, and I have to say that uh, the the servants, the purification servants, they they, they call it uh, Reinigungsknechte or the <laughs> Reinigungsdiener. Yes. That most of them are local, uh, coming from uh, from the local area. Uh, this and uh, this was not the case for all other stuff in the quarantine station. And what I also have learned is that uh, some of them changed between the quarantine stations. They were uh, employed in this quarantine, after that in this quarantine, and so on. So, um, yeah. yeah, yeah um, okay. Okay. Regulation uh, of sanitary cordon on the nation border recommends, uh, for example, um, recommends uh, servants to be widows, old widows. And yes. the old widows, and, and there is a, a um, <laughs> explanation for that. Uh, old widows um, were taken to look after the, uh, the page uh, to, uh, for the people that are developed the signs of the illness. You know. And, um, uh, the old widows uh, don't socialize as much as the young 
uh, men uh, and would not spread the, the disease further. And uh, moreover, they don't have much to live. So th um, this is specifically yeah. men's practical. <laughs> <laughs> and so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I have Thank found a similar hints for that um, during my current research on the Habsburg uh, military medicine and the Ottoman wars and uh, the servants or assisting staff in the hospitals. They also prefer women because they, from the, the same reasons as you said, but also that uh, they, uh, widows and uh, old women without children. Without children. So, <laughs> In creation is without sons. Mm, okay. <laughs> so. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, I have more questions. <laughs> uh, so uh, this one will be shorter. Uh, so we, uh, uh, we were talking about the isolation of infected individuals in, in terms of this isolation uh, or other treatments uh, of the subjects. Uh, were these individuals somehow uh, segregated on grounds of their wealth, status, religion, similar? Well, religion is mentioned in, in regulation in, um, for, for sanitary cordon in Dalmatia. Uh, but in, um, uh, in sense that uh, it was pointed out that uh, the plague affects all religions equally, uh, they had to emphasize that maybe because some of tragedies the population on both sides of the border had at that time. Um, only uh, there's one note at the end of that section that says the Jews uh, are mo uh, little more affected by the plague because they often trade with the, the old clothes. So. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> I've, I've showed, uh, I think um, we should use uh, in that uh, context more that we reflect on uh, mental health, a sort of mental health, because in the quarantine stations, we, uh, there was also a point that in most of them, I think to a high percentage, 80%, a priest, most of them is a Roman uh, Catholic priest, but I think when I'm, I'm remember correctly for Semun, we also have an uh, Orthodox priest there. And uh, what for me is important uh, to note is that I found indications that you know, normally the, the people had to pay their food and so on for themselves. I quoted that uh, case for the Wallachian uh, peasants. But I found also indications uh, in the case uh, for Transylvania that the sanitary commission financed because there were so many people in seclusion in this uh, once in this in the during the, the 60s, I think so was this was a plague outbreak also in Transylvania. And it was not possible because uh, um, that these people financed uh, their own food and so on. And uh, the uh, they organized uh, a own committee for that. I can remember this was called the Kronstädter Sanitätssubdelegation. And uh, they sent uh, food into those quarantine stations so that uh, the people had not uh, to starve. But uh, these are always small mosaic stones. It's uh, quite uh, difficult to, to receive uh, a full picture concerning um, uh, that, uh, your, your question. Well, uh, I have found uh, one quarantine site and I cannot remember right now, it's from Croatia, but was it uh, Zem uh, broad or, or was the, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Uh, that, uh, and this uh, plan, uh, special rooms for visitations for uh, Roman Catholics, Muslims and Jews 
so that's mm-hmm. but actually I, I i have not found such such mm-hmm. plan uh, for any other site quarantine site yeah and i don't know why <laughs> yeah what, what was the difference yeah so but what the focus for sure your uh, within the Habsburg monarchy was on the roman catholic yeah support So, do we have any other questions? <laughs> well, I would have more questions, but uh, it's also past our time. <laughs> uh, so, thank you. Thank you both very much. I think we, we will uh, continue our conversation uh, when we meet again in person, I hope, very soon. Uh, uh thank you very much for participating and um um of course my special thanks goes to our guest lecturers uh dr jesna and dr polizovic uh for their enlightening and informative contributions uh i think we have learned a lot today and uh that we have all been inspired uh, to further the research on anti-epidemic measures uh, so, thank you all. Uh, thank you also. <laughs> my side for your invitation and we will interesting keep, Thank you. We will keep in touch and we'll sure. continue our conversation. Thank you. Have a nice day. You too. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.